Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, delighted to uh, be moderating this uh, uh, excellent uh, topic and panel on balancing globalization and resilience in the time of crisis. Um, I know when I was uh, asked to moderate this session, um, there's quite a few conversations uh, with uh, the organizers as to is this really a tension or indeed an opportunity for us to reset the way uh, we design our future uh, globalized supply chains. But just a bit of a scene setting. Um, I'm at the University of Cambridge. Uh, my main area is around supply chains, and I've been a very popular guy over the last couple of years. Um, and it looks like probably for some years ahead, uh, lots of tensions in supply chains, many uh, organizations facing uh, difficulties, and, and now becoming relaxed to talk about them because they are so uh, dominant with everybody. Now, what's the responses uh, going to be? Are, are we going to see some entrenchment, uh, some rowing back from globalization? Um, a lot of conversations around is regionalization uh, the, the, uh, more, more, more appropriate for the world we now live in? Uh, we've seen many governments really try to pull back uh, on issues around healthcare and food or the essential industries. Um, thinking that that will aim uh, some uh, additional resilience to what they've got now. And of course, new technologies uh, is, is ch changing the economies of scale of manufacturing and production. So that too will have, uh, I think, a significant impact. But as, as we see retrenchment, and I think one of the interesting uh, points is even in food supply chains that we're all reliant on, I think uh, 30 countries now have... Uh, uh, resorted to you know uh, export bans to try to protect the, a, a very important uh, food uh, food supply chain. So in that context, uh, we've got a fabulous panel to discuss some of these issues, and I'm just going to go through and introduce the panel briefly, and then we'll kick off with uh, uh, some of their own, int own introductions and um, and have uh, uh, raised some of the topics that are at hand. So first, uh, delighted to welcome Rania al Masat, uh, Minister of International Cooperation of Egypt. Um, then uh, t to her left is Frank Apple, uh, CEO, uh, Deutsche Post DHL uh, in Germany. Uh, then we've got uh, Kumar Birla uh, from the Aditya Birla Group in India, where he's group chairman. Uh, to his left, we've got uh, Carmen De Sibio, uh, Global Chairman and CEO of uh, EY. Uh, I think we've all heard of that. And, and finally, uh, Aaron Kramer, uh, who's uh, coordinating uh, uh, activities for uh, BSR in his role as President and, CSR, uh, and uh, CEO. So, Right from a, a, an organization that helps many to a, a worldwide, world-leading consultancy, a fabulous manufacturing organization, as an organization that distributes products all around the world, and uh, a minister uh, of state. I think we've got all the candidates for an excellent uh, conversation here. So I, w I wanted to perhaps uh, just uh, uh, go through the first uh, set of questions um, that, that have been uh, posed by this uh, challenging world context that we live in. Maybe the first and foremost is having come out of COVID uh, or in, at the end of COVID perhaps, and now the war in Ukraine, uh, what impact has that had on uh, your organizations and more broadly the global economy? And I'll, I'll start off with yourself, Rania. So maybe if I go back to uh, the, the first quarter of 2020, when uh, you know everybody was just grappling with what COVID is and all of that, uh, there was a sense of uh, isolation and, and multilateralism was being tested. And I remember there were this period when we were not uh, very clear where we, we will get the masks and the sanitation, and all of that. And then, you know, by as as the months went further. Uh, the solution was that people had to work together, governments had to work together, vaccines, etc. So uh, the doubt that was there at the beginning a little bit uh, uh, got, uh, got better. Then we uh, started talking about uh, vaccine equity and are we distributing and all of that. But the, 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 
the bigger uh, over, or overarching theme was uh, multilateralism had to work. We need to work together to be able to go over this. And I think um, that sentiment to a large extent was there and then happened, uh, we enter 2022 as countries are starting to recover and, and uh, tr tourism is coming back and travel, etc. then we have uh, more sand in the wheels. Uh, and again, the, the revival of uh, uh, polar sort of uh, corner solutions for this. Um, so it's a very um, uh, challenging time in terms of rethinking where we are. Uh, absolutely correct that uh, the impediments with trade today uh, is actually adding to uh, price increases, but then um, uh, the social dynamics in every country is getting a little bit uh, more pressured. Um, and uh, the lesson maybe from COVID and for some countries who have been able to do it uh, is to try uh, and be self-reliant when it comes to agriculture, cultivation, uh, trying and figuring out uh, closer markets that can uh, become uh, lifelines in case things got, get uh, too complicated. Uh, so that has been uh, uh, moving along. Another word that is repeated all the time uh, is localization, that we need to localize uh, industries, we need to uh, localize uh, uh, you know, how we do our uh, supply chain. So these are, these are, these are themes that are there. Uh, they're being explored, but I don't think we're at a stage where we can say they have completely uh, replaced the system we are in. Uh, and uh, being Minister of International Cooperation, uh, cooperating with the world, with the multilaterals, with the bilaterals, with the businesses, um, there's a lot of merit in continuing that uh, because uh, it's only through cooperation that we will be able to, uh, I think, uh, at least discuss openly our uh, differences and try to uh, overcome them. Excellent. And uh, uh, for the audience, please do uh, come in with questions. I've been told to leave the questions till the end, but I'm going to break rank and, and just take questions as they come, so to have it as interactive as possible. I'm, I'm fascinated, uh, Rani, about... Um, food security in particular in, 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 in your part of the world, um, probably uh, reliant on a fair amount of imports. Do, do you see a, a particular tension there? Uh, we all often think of the last three or four months of the year being when, when food crises tend to hit. Do, are, is there any uh, anticipation of problems ahead? Uh, definitely with respect to food and food security, it's coming uh, again to the forefront and not just because of the war, but also because of climate change and the droughts and the difference in uh, uh, what we're seeing with the crop production across different uh, uh, continents. But Africa, uh, Egypt, uh, big importers of wheat, uh, key markets uh, are Ukraine and Russia. Uh, I can speak a little bit about our specific uh, uh, case. Uh, a few years back, uh, there was uh, an increase in local production, so uh, uh, half of our consumption comes lo is produced locally. So that, is, that was a step, I guess, today, which you can consider um, a preemptive action. Something else which is important was uh, storage. We're one of the biggest importers of wheat, but we didn't have a history of proper storing. That started in 2014, so today we have a stock till end of year. Uh, nonetheless, it's a shock. Uh, the problem today is that we don't know how long it is. Um, and um, if you're thinking about, uh, for example, the World Food Program that feeds a lot of uh, uh, those who are, who are in need uh, in, in Africa and other places, their key markets are uh, Ukraine and Russia, and therefore that puts uh, extra burden as well. So um, um, it is a complicated situation. Um, if I'm going to just uh, maybe link it to climate, because Egypt is hosting COP27 in November, uh, this puts uh, more focus on adaptation projects, projects uh, related to agriculture and also water for better uh, uh, water management uh, um, uh, or resource use. <coughs> Challenging times ahead, I think, but it's good to see some, some infrastructure uh, progress there. Frank, if I may jump to you. you, you must get some very early signals of how globalization is playing out with the ship shipping of goods around the uh, planet. Um, are we right to say globalization is, is uh, going in reverse, or do you still see uh, uh, activities that would suggest it's still um, pretty much the dominant uh, paradigm at the moment? 
Yeah, I, I believe that globalization is not under the trend. We have seen that in the last two years. You know, I always carry this mask with me. And two years ago, the people said that will be all manufactured locally. If I read it right, it's made in China. Uh, and not locally in Europe or in the US. And, and the reason is because that's a better answer. We will not be able to afford masks around the world for a price of 20 cents or whatever it is uh, if we had not produced it in, in, in China. And globalization has been a key driver why the world has recovered so rapidly. You know, starting with the vaccines, that was a global work share effort. We jointly produce new vaccines. We distribute, as a company alone, two and a half billion in, to more than 175 countries. That has protected a lot of lives. It had not been possible without globalization. You can see that across the world. The, the global trade is up, have been before the war above the level of uh, the pre-crisis. Now with the China lockdowns, that has severe impact on global supply chains because it can't, nothing can be produced, nothing can be moved. If that stays, then this is a significant impact. If we see that e China is easing again, as it looks like at the moment, then we will see even a strong boom in the, in the second half of the year because all the plants will produce a lot of stuff because demand is there. So globalization is not on the retrench and it will never be. Why? Because consumers will never pay for the same product twice the price. If you are, tell, a, uh, tell a consumer your mobile phone is more resilient produced but it costs twice the price, I say, I don't give a shit to that. <laughs> you know, I want to have the best value for money, and if you tell me it's just resilient, it's, that's your job, and you see that. What we see is that companies are moving in Asia from China to other parts of China, Asia. India might be a big beneficiary if we make it right, and we see that already. Our business in India at the moment is booming. High double-digit growth, because we see activities moving from other parts of Asia to India, you know, India is through the pandemic already. It's endemic already. Uh, it's a, you know, a herd immunity, and that's the reason why India is doing extremely well. And this is what you see, but we will not see that it goes from China to Europe or the US back, except for certain products. And this conversation about regionalization, would, would you see, uh, I mean, regionalization is a form of globalization. There's going to be inter, uh, trade between regions, but more concentration of trade within regions. Europe, uh, Southeast Asia, Asia perhaps, uh, within Africa, Middle East, and, and America, and of course Europe. So do you, do you get any sense that regionalization is, is taking hold? I, I think for certain products it might happen. I would not even take pharmaceuticals in, in that case, but you know, for ships you might see that because there's a political demand that you want to have you know, cyber security and control, that might happen. If that really happens for many other products, I have my doubts because the labor cost difference, the productivity difference, you know, globalization has helped the world to become more wealthy, to take more people out of, of poverty. And that I think will continue. It might be, you know, the Russia war might be now a big opportunity for Middle East and Africa even because that's so close. Europe needs a new partner somewhere. So where should we go? You know, if we not find it in Middle East and Africa, we will not find it in Russia any longer, apparently. So therefore, we need to find new answers, and that creates new opportunities. You know, we have a very young population in Africa. The business is growing. Some governments have to sort out their problems. But if they sort that out, you know, I can imagine that Europe will invest significantly more in, in Africa, for instance. And that creates then not regionalization. It creates new opportunities for parts of the world. Going, going to India, uh, Kumar, if I may ask about the Data Builder Group. You, you mentioned earlier to me that half your revenues are international, half India-based. Frank mentioned India is sort of coming out of the, the, the COVID uh, scenario. What's your view about local production, international production, and how supply chains are likely to evolve? So yeah, first of all, Frank is right. I think India is pretty much out of the COVID, and we are all back to uh, you know, leading normal lives, which is a huge relief. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, you, you talked about globalization and if there is a possibility of there being a reversal of globalization. And my very clear view is that that's not going to happen. It shouldn't be happening. What we should be doing is creating optionalities. So we have a large uh, manufacturing base in India and across 36 different uh, countries. We're a conglomerate. A large part of our business is manufacturing-led. I think what we have done or we have decided to do is one is to digitize, so you need to have 
more visibility across the value chain, right from the point of supply to the point of your, you know, your customer, if that's possible. So if there's some congestion happening in the port, in a port somewhere, you need to be able to get that information in real time. Uh, the other is, of course, to diversify. You need more sources, uh, you know, to source from more and more places, to source from different geographies, uh, to source from. And the third is delegation. You need a huge amount of delegation uh, to the whole procurement side of your business. Uh, needs to be upgraded in terms of skill sets. Uh, they need to understand how different events, you know, seemingly different disparate events across the globe can um, impact your particular industry. Uh, so I think uh, it's going to be optimization, a little bit of reshoring. Um, you know, I think that, uh, for example, we procure pulp for our fiber business. Uh, we used to only from Canada. We have started now to also from Sweden and maybe even South Africa now. But, you know, I don't think it's possible to completely uh, localize. Um, that doesn't make sense from an economics point of view. It doesn't make sense for, for the customer who wouldn't want to pay more uh, and whose quality of life you would impact uh, negatively. In some cases, for example, um, carbon black. Carbon black is um, used in everything that's black other than hair maybe, um, largely in tires. Uh, that industry structure is, is such that we locate close to our customers. Um, therefore, it's a different you know, a dynamic altogether. So I think it's also horses for the courses. Uh, you can't have one size fits all, fit all at all. Yeah, maybe add to that again. I, we hear that very often for many customers, diversification, resilience. And we have seen that as well, that after the supply from Russia and, and Ukraine for automotives in Europe got to a stop, we have seen an increase in activity in Latin America. Hmm. So from the same companies, moving stuff now, not from Russia, but doing more in Latin America. So that's resilience. And that is what companies are doing, like exactly as you described. So that resilience theme you've touched on, I, mean, I thought there were some great examples of uh, it's different in different sectors, it's going to be different, in, and, and as a conglomerate, I guess, you will see that in, uh, uh, firsthand. Maybe I can go over to you, Carmen. Just in terms of, in EY, you look at the uh, global business, you're also uh, part of the International Business Council. So... You've got a helicopter view uh, of, of operations as well, right across the world. What, what's your take and what are you seeing and what are you anticipating? Well, it's great to be here. And actually, my fellow panel, we are seeing exactly what you all have just said. And uh, the first thing was around digitization of supply chains. And so when we went into COVID, uh, we have a supply chain consulting practice. Only 25% of our clients actually had a digitized supply chain. And so they learned very quickly that they had to use technology much faster. Uh, and now it's, now it's above 60% where they're using technology in their supply chains. I think the word I use is dependencies. I mean, every company right now is looking at their dependencies and, and you know, where are their dependencies? And so, you know, the, the, um, the movement that Frank and Kumar th th have been talking about, absolutely, absolutely what we're seeing. What we are seeing in terms of China is most companies want to get to a place where whatever they make in China, they sell in China. But whatever they make to sell somewhere else, they sell somewhere else. And so Southeast Asia has gained a lot of that, um, but that is moving to different places. Today you hear this word friend shoring. You want to make sure that your supply chain is in a friendly country to your home country so you don't get into issues like this going forward. We are seeing all that, um, but in terms of globalization, globalization is here to stay. I mean, anyone who thinks it's going to go away, we're way too connected economically, technology-wise, for globalization to go away. So most of the things that are happening now, you know, Russia, Ukraine, causes a shift in terms of globalization, okay? The geopolitical issues with China, it's causing a shift. But people are so well connected. Technology is being used everywhere that, that it just will keep going forward. My own personal uh, view is Russia, Ukraine will eventually get to a place that you know, will work through it, right? And, uh, and whether Russia becomes you know, the next North Korea uh, and then you know, things get fixed from there. 
China is a different story. Uh, geopolitically, I think China is a different story. And, um, and that is something that the world's going to have to deal with and China's going to have to deal with. It's too big of an economy for, for the world to not pay attention to it. Isolationism doesn't work. I think COVID has really worked against the West's relationship with China and China's relationship with the West. I mean, I used to go to China three, four times a year. Now I haven't been there in two and a half years. And yes, we do Zoom and Microsoft team meetings. It's not the same. It's not even the same with our own people there. So I do think as China comes out of COVID, I actually think the relationships between China and the West will also get better. Now, are they going to be perfect? No. But I think people are people. When they interact more together physically, things will start getting resolved. All that being said, um, the, I think personally, I think President Xi had an opportunity to be the global leader in the world. Uh, when Russia, Ukraine happened, I think the reaction could have been very different than what the reaction was. And because of the reaction, I think the West, and in particular the US, has become more hawkish on China. Uh, and that's something that we're dealing with. I tell all our people at EY, we have to work globally, we have to be above geopolitics, but that's getting harder and harder every day. And, and from your perspective, uh, Kami, now, have you seen this geographically restricted supply chains uh, emerge? Um, is something you anticipated, or, or I, I guess the war was a bit of a surprise to everybody, but the, the Sino-US trade tensions has, has had almost the same impact on some supply chains. And we see other constraints about where product can come from, where can it go. Is that, and maybe I'll come to we, uh, others on the panel as well. Yeah. Is, is that something you're seeing more of that companies are having to cope with? Yeah, I mean, we, we saw companies looking at their supply chains, you know, before COVID and so forth, and before the issues with China and so forth. But, but you know, so changing your supply chain is a long-term effort. You know, it's not like you snap your fingers and you're going to change your supply chain. So they were looking at them. But let's be honest. I mean, globalization makes the world, you know, makes production much cheaper. And so companies were weighing, you know, do I produce this for, you know, 10 euros in, in uh, China or do I pr produce it for 15 euros in Germany? I mean, so, you know, it was a, it was a, risk reward type analysis i think some of the uh, some of the, what's happened in the world has changed that analysis and is changing that analysis uh, and that's certainly one of the causes for inflation um, you know and 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 that will continue uh, until we become much more efficient but i was uh, as i was saying to you there are new technologies even in supply chains that uh, that are being used and are starting to be used uh, that will really make a difference. Um, you know, I, I, I saw something really unique in one of our, uh, we're doing a joint venture with someone that we're creating where you literally can look at your factory and how it works in the metaverse and you can literally move robot arms in the metaverse that actually moves a physical robot arm in your physical factory in India or wherever it is. Now, those are technologies that are just starting to come to be, but imagine what, what, how that's going to change the world and how, cha how that's going to change where you make things and how you make things and the efficiencies and so forth. We'll come back to that fut futuristic look of uh, uh, supply chains. No, I want to move on to Aaron. Uh, Aaron, you, you're looking at uh, an organization that spans many organizations, um, and so pr probably picking up some other type of uh, feedback as to how uh, international s supply chain disruption is impacting firms. But maybe I can ask you to comment, you know, how is it impacting individuals and the wider society? First, I'd say that um, the apparent consensus that globalization is unstoppable is making me very nervous because anytime I hear lots of people agreeing, I start to think, hmm, maybe we're missing something. So um, with no disrespect to anyone here, but I, I think, um, I think it's, it's worth a good debate. So I think we're both underlearning and overlearning the lessons of COVID in Ukraine. So the lesson we're um, overlearning is losing sight of the fact that some of the fault lines in the world and in the global economy were present in January 2020. And some of them have, in fact, accelerated. So political polarization that exists in a lot of places, yes, certainly in the United States, but not only in the United States. Um, the fact that you had um, 
in the first round of the French election uh, that you had, uh, well, in the second round, Marine Le Pen getting 45% of the vote. The two parties that had dominated French politics for decades got 6.6% in the first round, surpassed by Eric Zemmour, who's a TV personality, um, a, a right-wing TV personality. So our politics were polarizing before COVID. That's been uh, accelerated. Geopolitical tensions. Were, were rising, that disputes between uh, the West and, and China uh, existed before COVID, they've been accelerated uh, by, by COVID. Um, so I think, I think there, there are fault lines in society that, um, that have only accelerated and we're in a new era. The post-Cold War era is over. The assumption I think that we're growing ever more connected um, that technology is overwhelmingly a positive thing, that markets deliver uh, the lion's share of solutions. There are lo I, I happen to think most of those things are true and important, but our populations don't share that view. And there is not support for uh, globalized markets in many countries in the way that was true previously. And that, that to me is a warning sign. So that's a way where I think we're overlearning the lessons of the last couple of years. One of the ways that we're uh, underlearning the lessons of the last couple of years, in, in my uh, opinion, is the simple fact of nonlinear change. And uh, I think we will continue to see it. We could have a, a, a very serious cyber uh, uh, event that knocks out uh, a large city somewhere and sparks all sorts of, uh, of, of other problems. It is possible that will be an outgrowth uh, of the war in Ukraine. I'm not, I'm not predicting it, but it's a non, there's non-zero risk that, that that could happen. Climate and, and extreme weather, we, we are seeing it, the costs are going up. We, don't, we, we know that, uh, that, that extreme weather is gonna hit more often and in more profound ways. We don't know when, we don't know where, India, has suffered through um, Indian Pakistan a horrible, horrible heat wave. Economies can't survive uh, in in those kinds of, of of environments. And there have been studies done of productivity in export facilities. Uh, I, I think in this case in India and changing light bulbs that brings uh, bringing the temperature down two or three degrees increases productivity. The problem is the the reverse is also true that the higher the temperatures go, the less productive workers can be. We just, as human beings, we have physical limits. So I think there's all sorts of nonlinear risks that, that are out there that uh, could slam the brakes on, uh, on, on, on ongoing prosperity. So I think there's a, there, there continues to be a, a great deal of uncertainty, and I think we have to come at this period of time with the mindset that the post-Cold War environment that has delivered a, a, an immense amount of prosperity and innovation, it, it, it's not that prosperity and innovation will stop, but the foundational uh, the foundational conditions that enable that are different now than, than they were in the immediate aftermath of, of, of 1989. And, and so I think we, we have to grapple with that world uh, as it is if we want to keep the train going. Okay, good to get a, a little bit of an alternative view, perhaps part of which uh, certainly I would share. I, I think the globalization, rather than saying is it going to stop or, or not, I think it's a different form of globalization we will be witnessing. And, and moving on to a little bit of the, the, the uh, you know, one of the checks and balances to make sure that as we make the, perhaps the most of the crises we're facing, it's not one black swan, but a series of black swans. And uh, in one of our lectures at Cambridge, I was saying I'm still looking for the white swan since the last three years. So we are seeing continued disruptions. Uh, but I think I see these as opportunities, opportunities for, for me embracing new technologies that allow uh, firms to operate in more regions, closer to market demand, perhaps uh, touch on the issues about inclusivity and bringing in more people into um, the win within the global, the, the globalization drive. Uh, do others see uh, uh, this reconfiguration, as I would put it, of globalization? I mean, maybe at a societal level or a national level. Rania, what, what, what would you see uh, as changes that you would like to see? Well, I was, I was uh, feeling very reassured uh, uh, with the, until we reached uh, the, you know, the last, uh, <laughs> our last I friend and colleague. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but I think, I think uh, 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 the way you described it uh, reassures us also because, because you're saying that 
uh, let's not read too much and let's not underutilize. And the two words that come out is uh, resilience and adapt adapt adaptability and innovation. And uh, uh, absolutely, um, even if it's not just at the firm level, but also the startups that are coming in, the value, which are supposed to be the value chains later on um, uh, in the regions that might be uh, the, the new hubs, if, if we can call it that. Um, and uh, the other very important uh, forward-lookingness, if I can put it that way, is the role of the stakeholders to make it work. So governments, you mentioned governments. Yes, governments need to think about uh, the regulatory uh, environment. Uh, it's an opportunity to be business friendly, if you will. Uh, uh, also the skill set of uh, those uh, that are going to be uh, working in these firms if they do come. So I think, I think that's, that's um, uh, there's an urgent need uh, uh, to, to think about those uh, more deeply. The only caveat here, and uh, I just put that because uh, I know that uh, governments fiscally are being pressured. So um, um, uh, that's, that's, that's a call to open up further so that you can uh, find this alternative financing, the FDI that will create jobs because one of the biggest risks today is the contraction that uh, 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 is happening. And I do appreciate very much that consumers will not necessarily want higher prices because inflation is already high. But uh, there's the policy framework that sort of also you know, designs what consumers might at the end uh, have options uh, uh, to choose from. So I, I, I think that um, um, uh, you know, the, the, the collective here believes in um, uh, more collaboration or that, that you cannot be by yourself. And I think that's, that's a message that needs to keep on coming out because here there are businesses uh, that you see uh, uh, what's happening in different regions. So, so that message needs to come out more forcefully if it's with uh, your um, uh, stakeholders, shareholders. Uh, I think more communication that this is what is good for the world. Uh, because again, it, if you know, politics plays uh, uh, different roles in different forums. Uh, so uh, so uh, being on message from those who, who see things and, and are able to uh, bet on the future is very important. Yeah, let me add to what the minister said as well. If you think about it, what, what we've heard about, what might be difficult. You know, COVID is a threat, but it has been a huge opportunity. In 10 years, when we jump forward, in 10 years, you will say, that was the period when we developed the vaccines against cancer. Because we have learned now through the crisis on a massive scale what you can do with mRNA vaccines. And the idea was always to protect us against you know, spreading of cancer in bodies. That will now happen. And in 10 years, we will say, COVID had a lot of fatalities, but it was a starting point of a journey that we get vaccinated against cancer. And that is fantastic if you think about the progress that promise. Secondly, the mRNA vaccines will be produced in Africa when the next time on Asia, the next time a new virus comes, because we can bring it to very small, you know, plants and operations, and you can copy that technology somehow, and that is, democratizing it and bring it closer to the market. So these are the upside. Nobody is talking about that. But in 10 years, we will say COVID was a breakthrough for humanity because we got better vaccines. The same is here. I believe renewable energy will now accelerate because if we don't make it wrong, if we continue to subsidize fossil fuel because we don't want to burn, take that burden on, on people, we have to put, take the burden away from the poor people but not in the rich countries from everybody. If we don't do that, then fossil fuel will be more expensive. That will accelerate the renewable journey. And, and that's the upside. And in 10 years, we say, instead of having a bigger problem with global, with global warming, we have a less problem because we invested more into renewable energies. And the reason was because we had a threat, which was high energy costs. And that is the upside. And that is what I think. We have to make globalization better and not reverse it. And I think we have to think about what can we do using the digitalization or whatsoever. If we make it better, then there is tremendous upside from both crises, the war in the Ukraine, as much as from the COVID-19 crisis. That's terrific. I mean, I guess the, what we really, the message that's coming across, that better globalization will in, inevitably give us more resilience, hopefully uh, address the ESG challenges on sustainability, and hence resilience in the more medium to long term. Aaron, if I can jump straight to you, is how do we get uh, more engagement with broader society into the globalization project? Does it need a new word? Does it need rebranding? Do we need to change our language? Um, 
Everything we've heard uh, of the last few days has been about addressing the challenges that we as society face. So why is it such a hard sell? Yeah, it, it, that's, a, that's a great question because undeniably, um, poverty has been reduced around the world. Innovation has flourished. More corners of the globe are, are participating in global society. There are many successes of the period that ran from 1989 until fairly recently. Um, I think that, um, but, but, they've been, but the benefits have been unevenly distributed. And so I think that's where uh, you have an issue. And so in, in North American Europe, a lot of people have felt marginalized. Uh, so I think you have to go right to the source of that particular issue. Um, in other parts of the world, women have been able to enter the formal workforce in numbers that have never been seen before uh, in human history. Access to health care has improved. That needs to be preserved because I think now what we're facing is the risk of, of, of that progress either being stopped or reversed. I'll give you an example of where there are trade-offs. Circular business models are great. Circular business models may expel women from jobs that have proven very beneficial. So we have to think about that innovation in a way that's going to sustain and deliver benefits to the people who have benefited. So, so we've had winners and losers, and I think we have to not sweep that under the rug and look for ways to preserve the gains that so many people have had, and nearly 100 million people have fallen back into extreme poverty over the last couple of years. Preserve the gains that have been achieved and go right to the source of the places where people have been uh, disadvantaged by new models because, you know, you go talk to a coal miner in West Virginia, they don't care if there are 10 people in China whose uh, livelihoods have increased tenfold if that, uh, that person in that community uh, is, is seeing a very precarious future. We have to find answers for the losers and sustain the winners. And not shy away from the fact that there are trade-offs. There, there are. And we also perhaps need to address the narrative of perhaps those 10 Chinese workers weren't the reason why. Well, the, 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 and that's part of the language. Um, but it's a great point to touch on, on people. I'm hearing many organizations struggling to retain staff. Uh, and they're fabulous organizations. Organizations you would die to have uh, been associated with a while back. Uh, assuming a bit of that is facing all of your organizations, what are you doing to build resilience in the workforce? Yeah, maybe before we, we answer your question, uh, the first thing is, you know, we could easily sit here having the COVID crisis and a war in Europe and rising unemployment. You know, I read headlines that we have fight for talent, yeah? That's great news. You know, what we have not, what we have protected, what we have not rising unemployment around that, that's fantastic news. So it's our job as managers to be better than our competitors. You know, we are working on that constantly to have higher engagement in our workforce so that we can attract better talent, that we have a purpose as a company, that we have a very comprehensive sustainability agenda because the young people want to see that. They want to work for a company with purpose. They want to work for a company who digitalizes themselves and is sustainable. So, but this is great news, that we are fighting for talent is much better than we have high unemployment. When I read the headlines, I always say, I get nuts, you know, if I see that, that nonsense, you know, we should be happy that unemployment is not the problem we face in addition. And we easily could face that. So that's good news and not bad news. So, okay, if we are not good enough, then we have to look into the mirror and say we are not good enough. But we, we are, you know, that's great. War for talent is great and not bad. Yeah, I mean, on that point, we, and you said it well, Frank, it's, a, it's this dilemma. If you all take your phones out and Google recession, the first thing you're going to see is unemployment. That's what causes recession. We don't have unemployment. In fact, I was in New York two weeks ago, I was in London last week, walking along the street, almost every single shop needs help. Help needed, sales assistant needed, everywhere. And so this is, this is a conundrum in terms of where we're going. But COVID has caused what, what I call a churn. Um, people have reevaluated the life. Uh, we've, we've, we're losing a lot of, or have been losing a lot of people from COVID. We hired 150,000 people in the last 18 months globally. Okay, but we've lost a lot of people. Our, our attrition rate went from the, you know, 17, 18% up to 25%. And so you ask, well, why is that happening? It's happening because a lot of people are reevaluating their lives. You know, they don't, you know, maybe they don't want to work as hard. Maybe they don't want to look at this. And yeah, pay is going up. We increased our, our pay in terms of the, the people who started EY around the world 
by 15, 20 percent. So that's that, you know that that we felt we needed to do and had to do. But there is, there is this reevaluation in terms of you know people's lives, what they want to do, what they like to do, what, what they don't like to do. Fortunately for us, we're in high demand, but we also train a lot of people. I bet in, in a lot of you know people's finance area here, you know people have been trained by the big four accounting firms, and so so that's something that we actually do for society that no one knows about, but but we do train a lot of people. It is a churn. I think we'll see that level off uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I think it'll be more post-COVID, and that will get out of the system. Two, I also think if there is more inflationary pressures, I, I do think companies will start looking at you know how many people they're hiring and so forth. So I think that'll bring wages a bit down, or at least level them off. And so this will be the equilibrium that that we have to get to um, to get through what. A lot of people are predicting maybe a tougher economic time in the next six months to a year. So you talk about building resilience in people, and I think that one thing that happened, a um, number of things that happened for us, we onboarded about a thousand people in the last two years, and we got to meet each other only in the last two months. Very different experience where you're working with people who are onboarded. You can't stop onboarding people because the organization continues to grow. Uh, therefore, your need for talent continues to grow. Um, and it just kind of brings into sharp focus the need to be together uh, and how that builds culture and how that builds team effectiveness. So when people talk about uh, working from home, uh, it really surprises us. You know, how do you do that? Why were we all going and working from offices for all of these years of our life? Uh, you know, were we doing something that was fundamentally uh, not required to be done? So a lot of people who've uh, had to be onboarded uh, I think it's becoming more of a multi-generational workforce. A lot of Generation Z that is agreeable and you know getting trained uh, to come in. Uh, new skills being developed, um, for example, digitization. Uh, can we, as manufacturing companies, find digitally native people who are happy to come and work for us as opposed to a digital startup in India? Uh, if you can't, then you have to develop new skills within your existing uh, people, uh, and therefore reskilling has been uh, a very big theme. I also think that uh, the whole organization, 140,000 people, uh, came together in a way that was quite incredible. So we all moved almost overnight to working from home. Different businesses had different challenges. If you're managing assets of $50 billion for people who invest in your mutual funds, the challenge is very different uh, when you're working from home uh, as opposed to when you're running a telecom network and you require towers to get uh, you know, uh, repaired, renovated, um, as opposed to people who are running factories irrespective uh, of what's happening um, because they just need to keep uh, the, the shop floor working. So been a very uh, different experience. I think everyone has come together in our case and created, created an even stronger fraternity. And I think resilience comes from the fact that you know that you're part of an organization and a fraternity that genuinely cares um, and will stand by you in, in a period you know, it, as tough as it's been with COVID. We just run a massive global uncontrolled experiment on work. I mean, you know, you could not have planned something like this. And so we've all had to adapt, as you say. And I think, I think where it's shaking out is just a less monolithic system, both for organizations and for the individuals who work uh, in them. So people want more autonomy. We live in an a la carte world. If I can use my phone to you know, summon a car or a meal or something like that, I also want that level of autonomy in my work. For the employer, I look at it and say, uh, well, if I can hire a great person in, and, and you know, these are things we've done, in Dublin or Milwaukee instead of where we have offices and I can add to the organization, I'm going to do it because that's the best way to attract talent. That's different. Both individuals and organizations want to need culture as well. And we just had a staff retreat last week and people came together for the first time. A third of the organization, maybe a half, wasn't there when, when COVID hit. So 
it's essential. I feel much better about where we are as an organization after that week and the level of excitement and camaraderie and, and culture building that we left with was off the charts. I mean, I've never seen anything like it in, in a four day period. So I think both for the individual and the employer, it, it's this two tiered system. It's not gonna be monolithic, we're, we're not going back. I mean, as you say, if you have to be in a physical plant, you know, someone once said in California, well, you can't pick strawberries by Zoom. So, you know, not, not every job can, can be done remotely, but for those that can, I, I, I just think we're gonna have that, that sort of a two, two element system of both individuality and still the need for, for cohesive culture. So are you gonna have an event like every week or two to build your culture or? That is a great question. Um, we're gonna, we're adapting as we go. We're adapting as we go. I, I can't predict what we'll do over the next 24 months, but we're gonna try and find the right balance. And I have to say, Aaron, I've changed my mind three times in the last six months about what the work-life balance right answer is. So it is a very dynamic picture. I just want to ask Ronnie. I just, just wanted to add that uh, also um, uh, there's a lot of adaptability from government side. You know, because you know when you have uh, uh, government which is very uh, bureaucratic in some way, now the experiment was no, we had to be flexible. We had to uh, uh, allow remote uh, work. So this, this, uh, if we had a fire drill and we had to test this, we wouldn't have reached the the where we are without the, without the pandemic pushing us. So this is also a, a change in, in, in mindset. But I agree with the different generations having different aspirations and different uh, levels of patience. And that's where purpose comes in for, um, for different institutions. Yeah. yeah, but even, you know, I understand what you said that about, you know, digital, you know, remote working, but it has a lot of upside as well. So, you know, I have never called, before the pandemic, I never called or video, had a video conference out of the blue with a country manager. I'm doing that now. I see that he's green. I call him or her. So it's maybe a heart attack in the first place for them. But, but then we have a night chat for half an hour. And that, as I've never done before, it was all staged, it was organized. You know, assistant called the person before and said, Frank might want to talk to you. And then they have the week of preparation. Now I just see on screen, let's call him or her. And that's great, and that it creates an interaction which is very different from what we have. So there's tremendous upside as well, in, because these are things we haven't done before. And that creates culture as well, because that creates all the middle layers out. You know, I talked straight away to a country manager with 100 employees. That's very different than having the regional guy, I will call her or him and will prepare, and I want to be present because I don't know if a person, that's all gone. And that is coming from the new technology, and that is cultural building as well, and not that's significant upside. So it's, I always say, let's look into the upside instead of worrying about the downside. I can't change that people want to work more from home. Let's work with more from home, but get them still connected to whom we are, and, and they they adapt to that really pretty rapidly. I think that also brings us back to a, a different form of globalization, where things can be done remote, uh, things can be going out to the metaverse. I mean, scary thought of meeting Frank on the metaverse, but um, we, we can. We can engage with employees we wouldn't be otherwise able to engage, and I think that's fabulous. I'm seeing this in technology, where the idea of digital twins allows us, I think, to operate in locations which we would say it's too difficult to upskill. It's too difficult to establish complex operations there, but it's now possible. Um, we're going to go to questions now. Um, we've got 10 minutes or so of questions. We've got a fabulous panel here. Uh, anybody would like to go, Alan? Yeah, it's coming, it's coming. Just a question about the relationship between globalization and transport costs. Maybe a question for Frank. Um, because if one looks at what's happened to container freight rates, I mean, gone up eight to 10 times in the past year or so. Mm -hmm. In the past, we would have thought that would have the effect of dampening international trade. That just hasn't happened. So have we, have we been exaggerating the sensitivity of globalization to transport costs? Yes, yeah, so first of all, you know, usually the cost of transportation as the part of the end product is overly, typically overestimated. For many products, it's relatively small. It's distorted nevertheless at the moment, and they will not stay forever on that level. They will come down again. And that's, again, I, I said that in other meetings already, that is the opportunity to make supply chains more green. You know, we came from this level, we are now here, 
and we will go to that level. So don't waste that chance that we keep the prices here and, and put a price for sustainable aviation fuel or sustainable maritime fuel in the pricing. Customers got used to this level. They will be happy with that level. They don't need this level. They should pay for sustainable aviation fuel as we pay. And then we will see a very rapid conversion. So that high rate might be a big chance for the whole economy if we make it right to convert from fossil fuel to renewables because we need more. If the price is higher, we can go to power to liquid midterm, we can go to HIFA and all this kind of stuff. And that's an opportunity. We should not miss that opportunity. If we think and customers think we can go to the same level, we will miss a boat. And then we are stuck again on two low rates which are not profitable for, for many, many carriers actually. Okay, just add a, a bit to that whilst others are um, putting in their questions. The price of uh, uh, distribution and, and has, has doubled, as, as some of the data suggests. Do you see that coming coming down? Um, yeah, to it will come down next year, but this year it will stay. You know, we, you know, if if China is unlocking, then we will see a rush in the in the second half, and therefore constraints will remain the same. You know, if trade is normalizing, then this is a money. And the second problem is, you know, we have still not recovered fully on intercontinental travel. And that is a limiting factor for capacity on air freight. And that will last probably longer than this year. And lead time's also doubling, I'm hearing six weeks now, 12 weeks perhaps, for uh, long container shipments. You, you see that settling back to previous norms? I think, you know, you know, the reason why we had queues in harbors where one is that the American infrastructure is not up to the surge of volumes last year, particularly the ports in the west of America. So now we have queues in China with different reason. If China unlocks again, we will see a massive recovery of that because China will know how to recover from the queues. They will do 24-7 which we didn't get until Biden mandated it in the US. We had not 24 seven, despite that we're 50 or 100 uh, vessels standing in front of your harbors. The president said, we have to work 24 seven. China will do that instantly and double the capacity probably because they say, okay, we have to get recovery for the economy somehow. So that will happen if they really get out of a locked, lockdown situation. If they don't, then we have a bigger problem, not, not from the logistics, much more from there's missing parts all over the world. We have enough stock still, but if that runs out, then we really have a fundamental problem around the world. Hopefully that doesn't happen. I want to make another point uh, on this whole issue of onshoring and offshoring. Uh, for example, we are the largest manufacturers in the world of aluminum roll sheets, and one of the big applications for those is auto. Um, if, if I have an auto major as a client who uses our aluminum roll sheet, let's say, um, in the door, and that's mandated by regulation because of uh, light weighting requirements. Again, going back to climate and um, carbon emissions. Uh, there's a lot of work that's happened between us. There's a lot of R&D. There's many years of uh, working together uh, as a supplier and a customer. You have approval cycles that extend over months and sometimes over years. You're selling to an automaker. He can't afford uh, you know, for, the, for, the, for the car to break down. Uh, he can't afford for him not to meet emission norms. Uh, so there's a lot of collaborative work that happens between, let's say, us as an aluminum sheet provider and the auto major. You can't just change that overnight and say that, okay, I'll move to another provider, another supplier, because we are both locked in with each other. Um, so it actually depends on which industry we're talking about. Whilst it's very easy to say that you need to onshore, uh, I think it depends on whether you can actually onshore. Uh, and if not, how do you work around that? Um, how do you create smart globalization uh, where maybe you have, for example, flexible manufacturing where you know, my client can come to me and ask for more or less quantities without having to renegotiate at that point in time. Uh, so you create flexibility, but that doesn't always mean that you can onshore and offshore uh, as you want to. That doesn't happen in the real world. Thank you very much. Question here. Thank you. Hans-Peter Lankers with the London School of Economics. Uh, you touched a few times on the climate agenda, and um, it's, it's 
clear that there are uh, some of the shocks that we've seen are going to help promote the climate agenda, uh, renewables, uh, etc. But there's also a need for global collaboration on the climate. There's a, a need for collaboration around technology. There's a need for collaboration around finance. There's a need for ambition, which requires political commitment. And political commitment is being drained if you have too many other issues on the agenda. Uh, where do you see the balance? Uh, and perhaps the minister could comment on that because of the COP27 preparations. Well, um, um, the, the, the way the COPs are always designed is that there's a negotiation track. So the negotiators sit down and that's where the, the you know, the political, um, uh, I, don't know, I don't know, resolutions take place. And then there's everyone else. And everyone else is really uh, this, this mode of globalization. That's where... CEOs come together, uh, governments, uh, ministries of, uh, uh, of finance, uh, uh, economic development, uh, civil society people, to try and see uh, how we can push uh, the urgent agendas that are affecting all of us. It's affecting supply chains, consumers, uh, uh, etc. If I take one, uh, one very important item that we start with, which, which is food security, adaptation and resilience become even more pronounced in this COP. Uh, they were discussed in Glasgow, but now in, in Sharm el Sheikh in, in Egypt uh, for COP27, they're going to be top on the agenda. And they require uh, uh, the pledges that happened in Glasgow to be implemented uh, adaptation. We had lots of discussions here the past two days. Uh, the business case for these projects need to be made, and that's where measurement comes in. Because on mitigation, there's you know, the KPIs and the measurement is there, but food security, water projects, we need to move more uh, into uh, uh, creating the business case. But I think the silver lining from this crisis is that it pushed it. Uh, it's, not, it's no longer a country-specific uh, challenge. It's a, it's a, it's a global uh, ask or a global uh, goal. From commitments to implementation is something else extremely important. Glasgow had so many commitments from uh, the private sector explicitly. So the, in the previous COPs, we were like the 100 billion that were committed, how much was dispersed? From Glasgow, it was from billions to trillions. So now, how can we actually bring these trillions to the countries that need them? Uh, these countries are rated B and below. So that requires, again, uh, coordinated effort. Governments need to do something. MDBs need to do more on their ODA financing. Uh, the uh, philanthropies coming in very effectively on the climate agenda today. How can and, you know, they be mobilized to push more on, on that? So there's, there, there's a, everybody's invited to Sharm el-Sheikh, so we, we look forward to uh, a, a very fruitful and engaging discussion then and, and, and to the build up to then. But I think that um, um, food security and what's happening globally today is going to be pushing that agenda more, faster than maybe uh, was, what was expected. There may not be. Oh, go ahead, yeah. in, in the Indian example, it's, it's uh, interesting. There are two constituencies who are working with us or pushing us, let's say, on the sustainability front, on the front of ESG carbon uh, emissions. So you have the government who have uh, norms, and I think that any cooperation with progressive leadership in India would be very aware uh, of sustainability requirements, sustainability sort of coalition that are forming across uh, the world. The other very big and important constituent uh, that is asking uh, of us what we are doing in terms of giving back to the environment uh, is our investors. Uh, so we have large global investors, uh, sovereigns, they're, you know, uh, investors who invest across the world uh, in companies across uh, industries. They're asking of us what we are doing. They want to see our sustainability report. Do we have specific, uh, you know, action that we have planned? Do we have... Uh, landmarks that we, that we want to achieve, that we aim to achieve in 2030, 40, 50. So we have very specific sustainability reports that each of our businesses have put out, uh, and investors track those very carefully. Um, so I think the point I want to make that the investor community uh, has become a great champion for the environment, and they will push you uh, in a nice way uh, to do the things that you ought to be doing in any case. We've, we've got a, a minute Two left. I, I'm going to give you an opportunity, Aaron. Okay. I'm going to give you, each of the panelists, um, what's the one measure, something measurable, that would tell us that we have, we're, we're getting to a better globalization, a more resilient, more equitable globalization? And maybe you could weave your response into that. 
I will do, and, and one fact from Davos, which I think is significant. The one senior Chinese government official who's here is Xie Zhenhua, who is the lead climate negotiator. That didn't happen by accident. It's a strong signal, and, and I think it's important. So the one thing I would say, I'm gonna tie it back to supply chains and your question. Large corporates, their biggest challenge on meeting net zero and other goals is scope three emissions. So supply chains um, need to find a way to be more uh, climate prepared, and that is a truly global effort. It means generating more renewable energy in more places. It means collaboration. It means investment from, uh, from uh, development banks, et cetera. That would make a massive difference in the world. Well, I think, I, I think you hit it on the head, Aaron. I think the one area that the, that the West can work with China on is around climate. And that's, that is something that, that's been pretty much out there. I was at COP26. This is something that uh, I think China is serious about. And it's something that I think you know, we can work together. I think to the points being made before on, on the vaccines, I think globalization, you know, you're going to see things like vaccines being developed globally. You're going to see things, you know, in terms of people working together on solving the, the climate issue, new technologies. I think you're going to see a rebound of nuclear uh, because we talk about alternatives. Solar and wind is not going to get us there, uh, period. It's just not enough energy. And so we need new sources of energy, hydrogen, nuclear, and so forth. Why don't you get Aaron and come in to come to the same uh, space at the, over the course of the hour? Come on, uh, any one, one takeaway for what would be a good measure that we're getting a better I mean, globalization? I mean, that's a tough one to come up with, uh, you know, off the top of the head. But I would think that the share of global trade uh, across developed and emerging economies could be one. Share of global uh, GDP could be another between uh, emerging economies and uh, advanced ones. Uh, you know, generation of new employment could be another. Uh, the, the, the gap between global trade, between emerging and developed and developing economies. Yeah, I Frank? think we all know the SDG goals, but there's one more important than all the other. If this is, we have to get more people out of poverty. And that's the ultimate measure for better globalization. Uh, it's, a, it's a tough uh, question, but I tend to agree with all my panelists and <laughs> fellow panelists. And I think uh, one measure would be, um, Will we be here in January in bigger numbers uh, and, uh, and uh, with, with more implementation after COP27 or towards COP27? Fabulous. One of the fabulous people-centric set of measures. Thank you very much, all. <laughs>